Welcome to the new automation mindset where AI automation and integration come together. Successful automation is so much more than technology, it's a mindset. On this podcast, we're here to learn about this mindset from innovative leaders who actually practice it every single day. From Fortune 500 companies to the boldest startups, these leaders have reduced cost, crafted experience, and fueled growth with automation. They have transformed their companies and their careers. I'm your host, Marcus Zern, and as Chief Strategy Officer and part of the founding executive team at Workado, it is my mission to find these top innovators in AI, automation, and integration and share their journeys with all of you. You may notice that this show matches the title of the Wall Street Journal and USA Today best-selling book, The New Automation Mindset by our Workado CEO, Vijay Tella. You'll hear references to the key ideas of this book, the growth, process, and scale mindsets throughout the show. If you'd like to explore them further, be sure to check out the book in hard copy or on Kindle. Today we have an industry special, so we're going to go into the distribution industry and we're going to talk digital transformation in the distribution industry. And uh, for that, I couldn't imagine anyone better than uh, Rama, Rama Tikshidar. He's the chief digital officer at uh, US Electrical Services Inc., US ESI. And actually before that, he was 11 years also in the same industry distribution at uh, Rexel, uh, starting off as an e-commerce lead and then uh, becoming the director for, for digital transformation there. So lots and lots of experience in, uh, in distribution. Interestingly enough, actually, you know, half of your time at Rexel was in France, right? In Europe. Uh, and then half the time here in the US and then Having grown up in India, you've, you've seen it all, um, which, which, which that's kind of cool. Um, but talk to us about distribution. So distribution is one of those industries probably most people don't know much about, right? It's not like something that's not a consumer product. It's, uh, you don't see it when you go to the supermarket or you don't see it on commercials on TV. Um, but it's a very important industry that actually makes you know, things uh, happen in our daily in our daily lives also uh, talk to us about distribution wholesale uh, is another word uh, for it uh, you know what was it like in the past uh, what is it like now and then how does your role as a chief digital officer uh, digital transformation how does that come in Thank you, Marcus. Pleasure to be here. Uh, appreciate the intro. Thank you. Um, I will say that I am not the expert. I don't think anyone is an expert in anything. I think we all continue to learn and grow. Uh, speaking about distribution industry, wholesale distribution industry, we are talking about something that is humongous. Uh, so it is not easier to get our arms around it. But that's what makes things happen, whether you're thinking about office supplies, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, name it. Uh, it's what helps us to procure material from manufacturers and get it to our end contractors or customers, depending on your industry. So we are talking about an industry, when you think wholesale distribution, we are talking several trillions of dollars, like 8 to $10 trillion, uh, which is a huge, huge market, which means a lot of opportunities, a lot of challenges, a lot of players, a lot of problems to solve. Uh, and if you think about particularly where uh, I come from, electrical distribution, that's, again, billions of dollars in market share and market size, uh, which means there is a lot of customers, whether you're thinking residential, commercial, industrial, who come to play. And how, uh, as a digital officer or a digital leader, we can understand the industry is number one before we can understand what is our role and how we can make an impact and influence the industry in a positive way using technology. If you think about distribution industry, um, the way it has grown, uh, depending on different segments within the distribution industry, if you're thinking electrical, plumbing, and HVAC, a lot of, it, uh, lot of distribution companies, they become major players by acquiring other small, medium distributors, uh, which is amazing if you think about what goes in the process of mergers and acquisitions in order to capture whether it is a different geography, if it is trying to understand how we can expand into different product categories, 
if you're trying to understand and capture different customer segmentation, it, it's, it's amazing as to what goes into making a distribution industry what it is. Uh, and to your point, not everyone knows how we go through um, the interactions and the relationships right from manufacturers and all the way to the end customer when they see whatever uh, material they procure at their door. Uh, and so it's very impressive. It's very challenging. The most important part of being in the distribution industry, it's the operational excellence that comes with uh, being a distributor. And we're talking about an industry where you have players who have been uh, in the industry for hundreds of years. Uh, some of them are 50 years, 70 years. And then it's not like some of the the tech revolution that we see now where it is primarily, if you think, 30, 40 years, right? Distribution industry has been for, uh, here for a longer time, uh, which makes it very fascinating. Another aspect of understanding distribution as an industry is also to understand what are the political, economic, social, and technology trends and aspects of what is happening at a macro level that shapes what goes on in the distribution industry? So, for example, if you think about uh, what's happening currently with the geopolitical tensions that has a significant impact on the supply chain, which causes disruption to the industry. For example, uh, what happened with the pandemic, I think we all uh, still experience pain through what happened with the pandemic, but it kind of forced us to get creative around how do we take care of our customers. Um, then if you think about the Infrastructure Act and the bill that comes with it, and you're talking about billions of dollars in funding that's coming from the government to modernize our infrastructure here, I think it has a significant impact on how we can uh, think of opportunities to leverage some of those trends, some of those significant funding and investment that's coming our way. Uh, you could think about how, for example, changes in battery storage and uh, revolution with green tech and sustainability, it has a significant impact on what role distributors can play within the industry. Yeah, no, I mean, look, this is, uh, it's really fascinating. You know, talk, talking to you, I, I think I learned so much more about distribution. I, I, I don't pretend like I knew, I knew a lot. I think for, for us as Workado being in the automation business, I think distribution is, is, is really cool. And, and I believe the reason is what you just said. It's about operational excellence. Everything is about operational excellence. You know, if I, if, if Workado works with a software company or with a manufacturer, there are certain things that, you know, we can't help with, you know, building software that's, you know, that's their business, uh, you know, building a product that's their business. What we can help with is the, the business processes, the, the operations, but, you know, distribution, it's almost in the purest form. It's all business operations. It's order excellence, it's supply chain excellence, it's a procurement excellence. It's, so we have a feeling that, you know, at Workado we can actually help a lot. And then, and then what I learned in the process, I didn't even know that before because we've got a, a, quite a few customers is, but you know, we have an OEM business where we sell Workado embedded. And it turns out that actually there are some software companies that focus on your industry distribution, like Proton.ai, for example, CRM, a company that's really distribution specific that is a Workado embedded customer. Uh, there is an ERP system from Epicor uh, that you guys also use. And then, uh, uh, you know, I had Carrie from Epicor actually on, on the podcast, uh, with me that they're an embedded, uh, customer of Workado. So I think there's a lot of, uh, interesting technology, uh, um, uh, uh evolution also happening in the industry. Is that true? hundred percent. Absolutely. If you think about, um, what distributors go through and how they formed major players within the industry going through a lot of acquisitions, um, there's a lot of disparate systems that come into play. Uh, and a lot of those come from legacy systems and tools and techniques we've been using. At the same time, the level of operational excellence that is required to manage inventory or pricing and margin improvements, uh, it, it is quite a feat to pull it off. At the same time, what I get very uh, excited about is to, uh, to your point, how you have a list of tech startups that are now, for example, if you're thinking about in the CRM space or how do we do job management, how do we do, uh, for example, distribution, order fulfillment. Uh, and if you think about how we can automate order entry uh, using OCR and AI capabilities, 
I think now we have leaders who have either worked in the distribution industry in the past, identified and understood problems and the pain points, and they want to be part of this uh, industry because they understand there is a lot of market opportunities here and there is a lot for a lot of scope to improve uh, the industry and how we can revolutionize it which is very interesting and it's a good time to be in the industry right now uh, especially in the last 15 years if you think about 15 years back if if a distributor had an e-commerce website they were actually already leading um, if you think about now that is never going to be enough um, also if you think about a lot of those problems were solved a little bit in silos by different distributor uh, businesses that were acquired by a larger company. And then some of these processes were standardized to an extent. At the same time, we could not find the synergies that you can find with technology because all of them were in either a different ERP or even if they had the same ERP, it was not easier to scale, to grow and take it to another level and provide the best customer experience. Now, what you're seeing uh, as part of the changes and the trends that are happening in the industry is whether it is through AI and automation and commerce platforms that are focusing on the right architecture, that is helping the distribution industry not be the digital laggard like it used to be. Uh, so now we are seeing there is a lot more growth and positivity as to how the industry adopts technology. Um, the key for us as leaders in the distribution industry is uh, to make sure um, it's important to understand our existing processes. It's important to focus on the operational ef uh, efficiency and effectiveness, but that in itself is not going to be strategy. It's also important how we use the technology um, to make sure we are uh, rethinking and inventing and getting creative and innovative around how we can uh, take care of our customer experience. Uh, a lot of digital native players have challenged what is happening in the distribution industry, especially if you think about uh, the Amazons of the world and how they are getting into whether it is janitorial supplies or office supplies and uh, auto parts and everything. Uh, it's not how it used to be 10 years back where you were a distributor and you did great and then you got your operating income and you got your revenue. Uh, it's not the same. Uh, so actually credit to the digital native companies to bringing in technology in the industry. It is making us rethink it, getting us to be a lot more creative than we used to. The same thing as to what the pandemic did, uh, it was unfortunate what has happened uh, in terms of lives and health issues. But at the same time, what the pandemic did to us is forced us to rethink and think outside the box and get creative around taking care of the customer. Something as simple as a curbside pickup was not a big deal if you think about it prior to pandemic. Now, if you think about it, every distributor, everyone is forced to think about uh, something as simple as curbside pickup. Uh, so I think it is a good thing right now that technology is reshaping and revolutionizing what is happening in the distribution industry. And again, as leaders, we need to pay attention to how what happens in a related or an adjacent industry. If you think about construction, for example, construction has gone through similar pain points when it comes to uh, adopting technology and uh, how it's still a lot of paper-based and Excel spreadsheet kind of an industry. Even though there has been a significant growth in adoption of technology in construction industry, you think about headset with cameras as to uh, understanding where the material is and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, technology being used around spatial recognition and everything, which is amazing in the construction tech. Um, there is a lot of construction project management softwares, procurement software companies uh, being a game changer in how construction is now forced to adopt technology and move faster. Now, what happens is, between construction industry and distribution industry because construction needs all the material to procure from the distributors. If you think about plumbing, HVAC, electrical, it creates a beautiful strategic fit as to how technology brings these different industries that was a little bit 15, 20 years behind, bring them much more closer to provide the best customer experience. Hmm. It's fascinating. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting backdrop. Obviously, you have an industry that has been very traditional in a way, but I mean, you, you highlighted how there is momentum going, maybe some disruption also uh, a happening. It's modernizing, uh, you know, a digital and e-commerce site is kind of like almost a must right now. You know, some, one of the topics and we're, we're, we're dropping a couple levels down here now, but one of the topics that we discussed quite a bit, uh, working together, right, is, uh, this concept of the composable enterprise. 
And so what I wanted to kind of get your take on, so you are the chief digital officer, uh, you want to drive the digital transformation in your company, uh, but you now in an environment where maybe there's there's been a couple of acquisition as you highlighted, right? So you have a whole bunch of systems. Uh, you have definitely a brownfield of, of systems that are there. Um, now, how can you make that happen? How can you make that digital transformation happen? And, and you know, one of, the, one of the topics we talked about was that composable enterprise. Talk to us a little bit, you know, what's on your mind, how you see that that could enable you to, to get your job done. Absolutely. Composable architecture is, before I speak about the architecture itself in terms of technology, it's important to wear the mindset of what is composable. Uh, and composable is, is the mindset of how do we solve problems as well, as much as it's the architecture itself. So before I drill into the technology details, if you think about distributor, again, going back to the fact that distributors acquire other distributors, right? And other, or, or else the other strategy is for a distributor to grow and create branch locations across different geographies and be in proximity to the customers. What happens is primarily they are making progress based on legacy systems that exist. Uh, and legacy systems are not going to help with being scalable uh, or be performance friendly or to help with uh, what you and uh, the Workado team and Vijay uh, speak about is the growth mindset. Uh, if you have to grow and scale, uh, it is important that we make sure we have the technology and the right mindset. Uh, the mindset is number one, then comes technology. When you think about the mindset, for example, if you think about how a lot of these solutions were solved within a distributor, a large distributor is probably silo teams working by themselves and coming up because they understand the process the best and very smart people, they put together solutions in quick time. It's almost like a fixer-upper uh, compared to a builder starting from scratch with a foundation. So the fixer-uppers, uh, very smart people, they solve a lot of problems, uh, which is the best news. The, the challenging and the limitation there is it is not thought through at a business or a corporate level as to how it can have a, an impact on the bottom line or the revenue aspect of it, the growth aspect of it at a company level. So what happens is a lot of these uh, solutions are probably a little bit more siloed and they work for what it is worth for today, kind of, but it is not built for tomorrow. Here comes composable architecture. How does it help? And there are certain key aspects of composable architecture that can help a distributor going through these kind of pain points uh, think of how to scale, think of how to grow, uh, think of how to be more forward-looking. For example, uh, a part of composable architecture is to have microservices-based technology and architecture, whether it is microservices, APIs, being cloud-native, being headless commerce. What it helps us with is modularity. Uh, it's important that when we are solving problems, we are especially in a distribution industry where operational effectiveness is, is the number one thing you can think of, the priority. Uh, a lot of processes are seen as standalone process, but process by itself is not going to make a company strategic. Uh, adopting whether it's a commerce tool or uh, an architecture based on composability is not going to be sufficient. What is important is how do we map out everything where we understand the interconnected of each and every process so we don't see a process in its silo bucket. Uh, for example, if it's a supply chain team working on solving a problem, we don't just work with the supply chain team. It's also related functional teams that can work in parallel uh, to co-create, co-innovate because then what happens is you're bringing the strategic uh, people along with the tactical people in the same war room and creating interoperability between the different teams, whether it is the business and the tech teams. Uh, composable architecture then helps us with making sure when it comes to scalability and everything, whether you are trying to have um, the right cloud native platform compared to you know the monolithic architecture, which is not very helpful to scale, which is not easier when it comes to integrations. It is not easier when you are trying to uh, move data between different systems and applications. Composable architecture helps us with making sure that is modularity and we understand what are the capabilities, the business capabilities we are trying to build. Uh, so we are having the product mindset around what we are trying to build for which end user. Uh, instead of having like a project-based approach to how we do IT projects and then based on a monolithic architecture, which is not sustainable, which is not scalable. 
And as part of the composable architecture, it's also building microservices around different components of what a, a, a digital commerce uh, platform need to do, whether you're thinking about making your order management system better. And also if tomorrow we decide we need to change our WMS or any other capabilities, it's almost, it's almost as simple as a plug and play. But when I say that it's almost as simple as plug and play, it helps with integrations and everything uh, using APIs. We still have a little bit of a longer journey there. And that's where it's a, a product like Workado comes into play with your capabilities around integrations and pre-built connectors that you have built with different, um, whether it is SaaS platforms and everything you can think of, correct? Whether it is WMS, CRM, PIM, search. So what happens is how do you bring this whole thing into a package that is an ecosystem now? So composable architecture helps us create a, an ecosystem where it is much more complete. It is not disparate systems trying to communicate between each other and it becomes painful to scale. Uh, and that is kind of detrimental to what a distributor needs, uh, especially knowing how a lot of those are uh, dependent on a lot of processes that exist for valid reasons within a distribution company. Uh, so composable architecture is the way to go. At the same time, we need to wear the mindset. We need to start the journey and ask the right questions as to what are the different applications and systems we have. At the same time, what are in a legacy system compared to how do we make it cloud native? How do you make it microservices based? Uh, we have the right data mapping. Uh, we make sure it makes it easier to discover data and move the data across those different systems and applications. It's fascinating because it, you know, compared to the monolithic world before, right, where you had, I mean, in the you know, most extreme case, you know, one company that would come in like an SAP or an Oracle, right, it would say like, hey, you know, just go with everything we have, you know, one suite, you don't need to integrate anything. You just, it's just one thing. Um, it, 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 it sounds like that's a, a good idea, but I think in practice, I think that's always causing, uh, uh challenges at the same time, you're also limited. I, I think it takes flexibility away of what you can do. You can't pick your best of breeds anymore. Um, but then putting it all together, playing Lego, if you want, with all these different systems, that, that's, that sounds like a beautiful idea. But I think it also comes with uh, challenges, right? Not everything, there's no free lunch uh, at the end of the day. I mean, it does need like a, a platform in the middle, like a Workado to make it work together. But then it also, all the participants also need to behave in that ecosystem in a, in a, in a good way. It, it, Talk to us a little bit what you're looking for. Now, if you're, if you're picking a new business system or, or frankly, also if you're picking like a platform like a, like a Workado, uh, what are you looking for in a technology partner for you that kind of can help you make that composable architecture work? Like, or, or maybe also tell us a little bit like maybe the anti-pattern, like what, what are you trying to avoid in that technology partner? Great question. Uh, I, I think uh, my, my team knows this about me. There are five things I look for when it comes to technology partner. Number one, I'm, I'm sorry for putting it this way. I'm not looking for a sales-based uh, technology partner, which is a good thing. I think sales is very important and key to building a product and selling a product and marketing a product. At the same time, what is important is, like you said, it's, it's called a partnership. Uh, so it is important for the technology partner, whether it is a SaaS product or whatever you're thinking of, it is important that there are five things that I pay attention to. Uh, and it's not in the same order of priority. All five are equally important to me. Um, but we'll start with kind of number one that comes to my head is it's important to move fast. It's important to be agile. That's kind of part of the composable architecture and help scale and grow uh, as part of the mindset when you think about what Cardo as an automation and intelligent integration platform. Um, but if you want to move fast, you need to keep things simple. If you try to complicate things using technology, then we won't be able to move fast. So being simple and fast, if the technology partner can provide it, based on, again, the composable architecture concepts we just discussed is important. Second thing, uh, that doesn't mean we have to compromise on quality. So how do we make sure whether it is a user interface, whether it is uh, AI-based user interface, think of like building a commerce platform that can be uh, AI-enabled out of the box where you can build user interface where it is much more easier for end user to use it. At the same time, it can be easier for 
the non-tech users to also leverage the platform to help provide the best customer experience, then what happens is you're, you don't compromise on quality. You're building a commerce platform based on uh, user experience and making it easier uh, without compromise on quality. Uh, third thing, if you think about is doing the right thing for the end user. Now, depending depending on what kind of a product you're having, whether it is a supply chain-based platform or whether it is a WMS, whether it is a CRM, it's important to understand that there are, what do you think about pre-packaged business capabilities? So think of like the microservices architecture as part of Composable. Uh, it, that brings in, here are the key capabilities that we need to have for this kind of an end user. It's almost knowing the end user and the, and the profile as to what do they need to do and also providing those capabilities where it is easier to kind of just deploy and start making an impact day one. It can't be where we are doing projects for a year and 18 months and two years and there is no end to it. And, you know, we got to be where it is fast, it is usable, and you don't have to compromise on quality. The fourth thing, again, total cost of ownership. If you think about composable architecture, uh, sometimes when you think microservices, API-based uh, platforms, it can get super expensive real quick. It is also important to make sure how we have a platform that can help scale at the same time not break the bank for, uh, for example, if it's me picking a, a platform uh, or a SaaS uh, product. Uh, the last part, which is the most important part, actually, if you think about it, is it's called a partnership, which means it's important that, uh, that we align between the tech partner, the software product company, along with the customer, that we make sure we understand what is the vision and goal and roadmap of the customer and what is the vision roadmap for the product that we are trying to buy. So when these two are uh, having synergies, so if I have a vision as to what I want to do in the distribution industry, I do want to make sure if I'm picking a tech partner, they understand where I want to go and how they can be a partner as part of the journey uh, and help uh, make me and my teams better. Uh, because it's it's a partnership. It's not me just trying to buy software for the sake of it or use technology for the sake of it. And then you don't know what was the vision and uh, where do we end and how do we have KPIs and metrics to measure success. Yeah. No, it's uh, it, it's really interesting because I felt that through our interactions, I, mean, I think hopefully we were, you know, giving each other uh, something. I mean, I think you introduced us to a new industry that we hadn't really thought about that much. Uh, and then the more and more I learned, I felt like, hmm, there's actually something, uh, uh, um, something there. I mean, I think it's uh, it's obviously great to have US ESI as a as a customer of Workado, but I think that's not all of it. I mean, for us, really, I think your mission to to kind of transform that industry, I feel that we can actually help with that and help the entire industry. Uh, frankly, and so hopefully we'll have uh, we have interests that are uh, that are really aligned. Now, Rama, you you um, you talked very briefly about the, the the thing everybody is talking about at the moment is that's AI, right? So you 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 uh, you in, in injected it there in, in in one of your sentences, but but talk to me about AI. So we started off with the with the industry uh, with distribution. I don't think. You and I, when we when we had our interaction, we talked like necessarily. Oh well, how do we use AI? I don't think that was a topic. The topic was how do we make customer experiences better in the distribution industry. But then, in your opinion, how, how does AI actually help with that? How is AI a means uh, to an end to transform the industry? What? Are there any specific use cases you see, or how, how, how do you think about AI and, and generative AI also? That's a massive question. That's, uh, that, that can itself, you know, we can spend hours on it. But just speaking about AI, for me, it is important that we are not trying to find uh, what problems we can solve with AI, but instead we should start with uh, what is the kind of experience we want to provide, whether it is working with our end customer whether it is for salespeople within an organization or how do we interact with even our manufacturers. So the different stakeholders that go through the value chain. And then when you start mapping out the problem and everything, you are always going to find that AI has a lot of applications, uh, whether you're thinking about natural language processing, whether you're thinking about neural search, whether it is image recognition, whether it is text-based uh, OCR scanning, 
whether it is visual, a lot of progress has been made within computer vision as we speak in the last couple of years, especially. I think it's important for us to map out what is the experience we want to provide to what kind of the end user before we start getting excited about uh, either whether it is generative AI or chat GPT. Uh, I, I think it's also important at the same time for all of us to embrace AI. AI is going to be here. AI is already solving problems uh, better than a lot of us can even imagine. Uh, I think it is going to be revolutionary. It's going to be a game changer. At the same time, the one thing that we need to uh, be cautious about is when we think about AI and automation, as leaders, we have a responsibility to use AI and automation where we're trying to create. Uh, so when you think about Workado and the automation mindset and everything, uh, I know that you and Vijay come from a completely different philosophy, which is more entrepreneurial and how we can create and innovate, which is amazing. Uh, not all of us understand automation and AI the same way as some of you leaders uh, and pioneers uh, have been understanding and trying to explain the concept. For example, the thing that does worry me is around how, especially in the distribution industry, you think about operational effectiveness and then you think about inventory management, pricing, and then how do you cut costs and increase your, uh, whether it is your operating income, your profit and margins and everything. AI and automation is not just a means to automate manual tasks and keep doing things that we've been doing and then uh, do more with less people. That should not be the aim. If it is the aim, those distributors will continue to uh, be there for a decade or so. But when we use automation and AI to the best capabilities it can provide around the different components, right? Understanding the interaction between a salesperson and a customer and then understand based on that understanding how you could use a computer vision to create a new experience or a customer service model, uh, then you can even think of monetizing uh, based on a new customer service or a business model that you create. So from my standpoint, I'm more excited in using automation and AI to create newer business models, newer revenue streams, uh, then just focus on how can we use AI and automation to automate a process that already exists. Because what happens is a lot of these processes are built based on disparate systems and the constraint was legacy systems, not the composable architecture we were talking about. So what happens is we end up automating something that is not perfect. It actually does the opposite of what we need to be doing. Instead of being innovative and creative about it, we end up making a problem that is already big enough and we are thinking we'll apply the concepts of AI, generative AI, and everything to automate. And then what happens is we just magnified the whole problem without solving for the customer's experience, without solving for how we can innovate. That's one aspect of it. Do I think there are use cases, if you think about particularly generative AI, 100%. Uh, like when we started the conversation I was talking about, we need to pay attention to the, the political, economic, social technology trends. Uh, and in line with that, I think what is important is that we understand the demographics and when you think about the, the age factor of people in the distribution industry, uh, you know, I, I would um, actually um, ask for fellow distributors to think about when they are in a room, like if they look around, two out of five people are closer to retirement than not. What it means is that it's going to be younger workforce that needs to join uh, an industry that is very traditional in nature, focusing on operational effectiveness. How do we bring in the younger workforce who are used to technology in a different way uh, than most of an average age employee within the distribution uh, company? So if we have to do that, we need to translate some of the context. If you think about generative AI, the thing that it lacks is context. Uh, how can we use our own people before we try to automate the jobs and then, you know, we want to have this lower head count? How do we use context from the people that generative AI lacks and create newer business models, newer processes that are different than what we have been doing, then we can be a lot more profitable and those companies will actually win in the long run. Uh, when I think about it, AI is going to create newer jobs and you think about distribution industry, a couple of things I think about is that it's going to be these context enablers, context developers who will help us to have a better training uh, for example, if it's a salesperson who's been working with a customer with a great knowledge about product, if you think about electrical parts, it's a little bit more complex. How do we translate that kind of knowledge and create context around it? Then generative AI can be a lot more sophisticated 
as it, it is meant to be. Um, and also, I think uh, that it is going. It is important that uh, we leaders also think about having future roles like chief, what I call a chief redeployment officer. So the people, whoever we are trying to automate their job and the task, which we are all fascinated about, how do we also think about how do we reuse their skills and talents uh, of smart people? So we are not just focusing on replacing and creating this uh, high percentage of unemployment rate, but redeploy them into newer business models, right? So it's kind of like you're not, you don't want to be losing people with context. And I know that not a lot of uh, leaders are going to be happy with what I'm saying because, you know, everyone wants to do more with less. Uh, but I think you can always repurpose uh, your own people uh, who have had context working for your company. It's much faster, I promise you, than trying to get someone newer and then go through the same training process uh, with them. So how do we use generative AI working with the people whose tasks we are trying to automate. Uh, now, of course, there is going to be people's jobs that are going to be lost. I'm not saying let's save everything. But I think net on net, if we are leaders and strategic thinkers and we have uh, the principles of emotional intelligence and everything, how do we create more is very important. What we don't want to be doing is what we've been doing the 1930s and everything where we end up removing more jobs and increasing productivity, but we did not create enough. Uh, so the onus is on us to use automation and AI to create more than how much we remove, uh, which is important. If you don't mind me going back to, you're talking about business systems, composable architecture, where all of these connect. Uh, and I think it's all connected. If you think about the flow of our conversation is also, uh, if I think about the next set of business systems, and if I think about composable architecture, then automation and AI, uh, the way I think about it is coming from an electrical industry, it's almost like we got to be like a transformer. Uh, what I mean by that, I hope my analogy makes sense, is a transformer's operating principle is mutual induction. And mutual induction is kind of like um, understanding the power of a transformer to uh, transform, uh, transfer power between a primary coil and a secondary coil, and then magic happens, correct? That's mutual induction. What I mean by that in our world is how do we have business teams and technology teams acting as the primary and the secondary coil and you create a mutual induction using a composable architecture where we have made technology using composable architecture and large language models and AI where the business and tech teams are in it together, solving for problems together, not creating uh, different solutions in silos. When we do that like a transformer, it is quite powerful and then we will all win. Um, I do think the way the business system using composable architecture, LLMs and AI, it's going to evolve. Um, there is going to be a day, I don't know when, I will not bet my money on it, but there is going to be a day when uh, we will see that uh, no matter whether you are a salesperson, no matter who you are, whether you are a salesperson, whether you are a, a product specialist, whether you are a quotation specialist, whether you are an inside salesperson or whether you are working in the warehouse, you just have a profile, a device, no matter how it looks, understands your profile. At some point, you need to feed information about your profile to it. And you should be open if you are open. Now, again, keeping in mind that is data privacy, secu security, governance in place. How much of a data you want to provide to that device? Um, I don't want to call it a laptop anymore. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an intelligent device. It acts as your assistant. Depending on what you keyed in as your profile, we don't even need to install a PIM or a CRM or all the different apps that we need to think about. I'm not saying the SaaS uh, companies are going to be happy with what I'm thinking here. That is not going to be where we need to deploy apps anymore or buy software and a thing. It's like, so think of it like a Workado as your next-gen operating system. Workado understands the customer's profile or the end user's profile and then takes care of everything you need, deploys, and then based on usage, it collects the data. And, and the complexity is here is how do you move data across these different use cases, uh, but it is something that can be done. It just requires a lot of processing. It just requires how do you do the math behind what data you're thinking about, whether it is customer, product, location, what kind of uh, user profile you're thinking about. Then what happens is it is an intelligent assistant, virtual, that is constantly listening to you, understanding your behavior, learning. It's, it's machine learning, correct? And then how it gets better at whether you want to provide it an audio input, a visual input, uh, whether it is text, uh, how do you communicate with it? 
it just becomes your best assistant and makes your job easier. Now, how does it help with technology? You're not having a high toll cost of ownership around building all the apps and making sure you are keeping in uh, touch with what is the terms of those software and everything, and then again having to redeploy and everything. This intelligent platform decides when you need that functionality and business capabilities installed, and then actually removes it when it sees like you're not using it anymore. That it, then it is not the customer's problem or the company's problem as to how they go through platform uh, migration and then replatforming and then going from a monolithic to more like a headless commerce architecture, composable commerce architecture. I think the way we have been doing things is going to change, um, which is very fascinating and I'm excited about it. Um, at the same time, it is important for us to remember what makes us uh, human beings compared to the intelligent assistants that I am uh, envisioning that are going to make an impact and going to be there uh, in our lives is we were born creative, we were born with curiosity, and we have emotional intelligence. It is important that we stay humane, uh, understand what makes us powerful together uh, with our emotional intelligence, the curiosity and creativity, and we are not using automation and AI to make AI and the assistant smarter and creative than us. It is for us to make sure we continue to push our boundaries, get out of our comfort zone. As we embrace AI, we also continue to get creative. Whoever gets more creative and understands the impact that AI is going to have, they will win. And when they win, they win big. And they win, when they win big, they will revolutionize industries as we know it. Uh, I know this whole thing can be scary, but when we revolutionize an industry, there is a ton of opportunities. Now, going back to how we started the whole conversation, it's all connected. You're talking about eight to ten trillion dollar industry. We can convert it into a fifteen twenty trillion dollar industry. You're thinking electrical distribution, billions of dollars. We can make it as big as you want, like one trillion dollar in quick time. But that requires how do we start focusing on what we need to be focusing on, which is more forward thinking. We should have a a decade, two decade based on a horizon and strategy, not just focus on what are we going to do for twenty twenty four that we can uh, take care of uh, our headcount and margins and profitability, then we are going to be short-term and tunnel uh, vision. And those are not the leaders who will help revolutionize the industry. Uh, so I know you and Vijay speak about the automation mindset. I also understand what you're also talking about and implying. It's an implicit thing that you're implying through the new automation mindset. What we need, the need of the hour, is a new leadership mindset to create, to innovate. No, perfect, perfect. I mean, listen, this, um, there's a lot to digest for all of us. I, 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 uh, for the record, I love that analogy with the transformer. You know, I studied electrical engineering, so maybe I'm, uh, I'm a little geek on that side, but I think that's a, that's a really good one. That fusion of IT and business is so important. Uh, the transformer analogy is, uh, is beautiful. Um, you know, on the AI side, I think one thing that stuck in my mind that someone told me is like, you know, if you're worried about AI as a person, right? If you're worried about generative AI and so on, the biggest mistake you can do is probably to ignore it and not think about it. Because I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that people who will not use AI, I, I can almost predict that they're going to be the losers in the end, unfortunately. I think you got to embrace it. I think it is there. Uh, I think we're at the very beginning. I think 2023 was all about tech, technical stuff about AI or generative AI. I don't think we've gotten into the use cases yet too much. I think that'll, uh, that is almost like for the years to come. I, I'm actually really excited uh, uh, of us working together and, and, and figuring this out. I do see those LLMs, these large language models, almost as digital brains in that composable architecture, together with the workflows, together with the systems, there's going to be these digital assistants sitting somewhere in there making, making this all work. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think it's going to be interesting years. Now, you ended up talking about that new mindset, that, that leadership mindset. And, and I think I think by now, probably everyone in the audience has realized that you're probably not the typical 
IT executive in distribution. I, I would assume that. I would assume that there's a, a lot of different, much more traditional people. Um, you are, you know, VJ, our CEO, he was on this podcast called The Rebel Entrepreneur. So there's a, something about people who are really passionate about making things better and, and being in there. Uh, and, you know, this can be an entrepreneur creating a new company, but it can be someone in a larger company who's just trying to transform things. I, I, would, I, I think of you as that kind of a, 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 a person. I think there's cultural things that play into this. I mean... You know, you know that I grew up in Germany and I would say that Germans are probably in you know, the bell curve of Germans is probably the opposite. I mean, there's, they're more, they're much more motivated by fear of not doing something right. Uh, they're, they're just listening what their, their, the boss tells them to do and, and they're trying to, you know, stay on the low. They're not the people, you know, we have a, 140 customers in, in Israel. And I would say that that culture, that country is full of rebel entrepreneurs that are trying to make things better. Tell us a little bit about how you think about this. Like what, what gets you going? What is your mission? What, what leader do you want to be? And then also maybe you have some advice to your colleagues. Like how do, how do you feel IT leaders, technology leaders ought to be? Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot, uh, Marcus. And and I know uh, you know this. I learn from you every time I meet you and I've, uh, I'll have i continue to learn as I uh, digest what Vijay has been talking about. You know, the only way to learn uh, is, um, I'll, I'll say this in a quote, which is one of my favorite quotes. Um, I don't know who said it, uh, which, is a shame, which is a shame, but uh, just to give credit to the quote, it, it says, you only get smarter by playing a smarter opponent. Um, so as leaders, whether you're technology leaders, business leaders, whether you're trying to run a, a country, no matter what, it's important for us to understand that we can learn and learning is never boring and there is never an end to it. And we can learn from different cultures like you're talking about, whether it is Europe, North America, South America, no matter where, we, we have to learn. That's the only thing that makes us uh, smarter and it'll keep pushing our limits and get us out of our comfort zone. Um, you know, different cultures have different strengths. Uh, there, there are cultures we can learn from as to how to be a lot more like an engineer, process mind, uh, you know, cultures where we can think about, uh, when you think about Israel and all the tech startups and the innovation that happens there, we can learn from that. You think about um, here, you know, we, we are very creative and very innovative and, uh, you know, we are always forward uh, looking, forward thinking, and we have a major role to play in, in, in across you know, the globe. And when you think about the Asian countries and, mm, you know, they, they are, if you think about what people say about India, it's, it's really the future, correct? Uh, you're thinking about a lot of uh, innovation that happens around technology and how fast it is happening and how people are embracing it, uh, right? I think we have to learn from every culture. We have to learn from every person in the room. Uh, we have to learn from why someone put something together in a specific way and how we can always find ways to have that educated discussion and debate um, and not take things personal. And, you know, uh, we got to leave the ego out of the window and just keep learning. And when we keep learning, uh, no matter whether you're a technology leader, no matter who you are, with what title, titles are irrelevant. Titles are not what make, make us leaders. Um, uh, and, you know, whether you want to call yourself a CDO or a CIO, if you're just, uh, you know, trying to take care of, uh, uh, the uh, office supplies, everyone has an important and key role to play. Uh, and, and the leader's job is to make sure how we bring everyone together. But in order to bring everyone together, people need to know what are we together for, which means we need to start with the vision. So we need to start with the vision and then we bring people together. Uh, and I think it's most important right now as we see that uh, we all get out of our comfort zone and embrace uh, change. Um, it, it can be disruptive, it can be painful, but that's what uh, we've been going through as human beings, civilizations after civilization, thousands of years. So there is no end to it. Um, just keep evolving, redefining, reinventing, reinvigorating ourselves. What a, what a beautiful uh, definition of, I think, what we would call the growth mindset. 
you know, so kind of the opposite of you having this closed mindset. Uh, and, and I think you made that point, which I think is very true, uh, that automation has been looked at as something of a closed mindset kind of thing. It's like, take what you have and just, uh, you know, replace people with, with robots, you know, but that's not the kind of uh, new automation mindset at least we are really talking about. It is about the learning. It is about the evolving. And, and I think AI and generative AI is one of these new, you know, areas where we all get, you know, put out of our comfort zone and, and uh, have to embrace it. Hey, Rama, this was, uh, this was amazing. Thank you so much for, for spending the time together. Uh, uh, I'm very excited. Uh, you just have this conversation, but also working uh, with uh, US ESI uh, together, making that composable architecture a reality and then uh, uh, seeing what we can do together for the distribution industry. Thank, yeah. thank you so much. I, I, I do want to make sure that I thank you, Vijay, the Workado team. Uh, it's, it's, I think I don't see Workado as a product. I don't see Workado as an, uh, just an automation platform or integration or orchestration, whatever you want to call it. I think Workado is a philosophy. Workado is a mindset. And I think it's going to push uh, your competitors. It's going to push the customers to embrace things in a different fashion. That's what I'm interested in more than the software and the product itself. Uh, I think we all need to embrace. And I think you and Vijay and the team, you, you're doing a phenomenal job in, uh, you know, kind of getting us out of the comfort zone. So don't stop. Keep pushing. That's the only way we're going to get better together. Thank you so much, Rama. Amazing. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you all so much for tuning into today's The New Automation Mindset, where AI automation and integration come together. If you want to learn more about the key topics we've covered in the show, you can find them in the book, The New Automation Mindset by our Workado CEO, Vijay Tella. Also, leave us a comment and let us know what you thought of today's conversations. And don't forget to subscribe so you will never miss an episode. I'll see you next time. 